These are Disney's nine old men, legendary pioneering animators. They created Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Pinocchio, Fantasia, Dumbo, Bambi, and more. But we're gonna be focusing on two of these animators specifically, Frank, and Ollie. The reason we're focusing on them is because they wrote The Illusion of Life, which is an incredible book that can be a bit expensive on Amazon, but it has a lot of great knowledge for animation. But most importantly, they break down the 12 principles of animation, 12 principles that they use to create the magical animation that we see in Disney films today. Mastering the 12 principles of animation is mastering animation itself, so we're going to be going through all of these one by one and using Blender Open Movies as an example. Squash and stretch is probably the most popular principle and you've most likely heard it even outside of the context of this list. And what it can do is give a sense of weight, flexibility, or impact to the objects that you are animating by squishing and stretching them. This is normally done by extending the armature past its limits or by using the scale function. It's important to note that if you're doing a realistic animation, say such as charged, you need to ensure that the objects you are doing maintain volume. So when you stretch it down vertically, you need to also apply that to the horizontal stretch as well in order to convey realism. However, if you're doing an unrealistic thing such as Sprite Fright, you can go ahead and use the squatch and stretch to add a cartooniness or rubberness to your characters to add comedic effect or to emphasize some of the impacts that they are receiving. Anticipation is used to prepare an audience for a character's action. For example, swinging a baseball bat or throwing a ball, the character will pull back slowly before releasing all of that energy forward quickly. This is shown to great effect in Big Buck Bunny and some of the fight sequences and how they'll line back for the impact of their action. Staging refers to bringing the audience's attention to a object or point of focus within a scene. Now, this is oftentimes done with cinematography, lighting, shadows, color, and more. However, motion plays a role in this too. Let's take a look at charge as an example. In this scene, very much the battery is the point of focus as it is the most important element or object of this entire short film. And you'll notice here that motion is used to help convey attention to that battery, that as he goes to grab the battery, it is stiff and in place, so it is holding all the motion around that battery to get it to move. And then shortly after we see here that with the robot, they're fighting over with the battery being the center element of kind of gravity in the scene and conveying a lot of weight and importance as it kind of pushes the characters around, so to speak. Now straight ahead action and pose to pose is actually kind of faded with 3D animation. So straight ahead action implies that you actually would just animate forward frame by frame as you were drawing. Whereas pose to pose would be that you would draw the keyframes and then go back through and draw the in-between frames. Of course, with 3D animation, we primarily work within keyframes and the computer actually draws the in-between frames for us while we manage all the other elements within the graph editor. However, there are still some instances where you may want to do straight ahead action and you can actually just play with your character and move them forward frame by frame. This is something that I've done in some of my stop motion animations before to kind of intentionally get a few more errors in there and give it more of a stop motion look. Now follow through and overlapping action are some of my favorite principles because they convey a lot of character and just kind of like fun motion when animating. So let's say that you're working on a character running. Well, their ligaments may move at a different pace. So you could safely say that your legs might be carrying your torso and then your arms might be dragging behind just a frame or two. And that slight offset can add a ton of realism to your animations, even when you're aiming for more of a cartoonistic style. And other elements such as your hair or portions of the body that might carry more weight or fat might tend to take a second or frame or two to kind of catch up to the rest of the motion thus just adding a lot of interest to your character's motion by adding overlapping keyframes and elements that create a more dynamic visual presentation. This, of course, is prevalent in things like Big Buck Bunny, where we have a larger character with floppy ears, and then also very much so in Sprite Fright, where our characters have a lot of elements and clothing and other things on them that are kind of bouncing around as well. Now, slow in and slow out as a principle could also be referred to as easing in and easing out to make it a little bit more modern. 
So when we talk about how we can ease in these values on our Bezier handles when we're working in the graph editor to change the speed from one keyframe to the next, we're essentially affecting the slow in and slow out. But slow in and slow out does not just refer to two keyframes, it can refer to an entire character's actions. Look at Agent 327 from Blender's open film here. As he enters the barbershop, he's at first very slow, moving into all his actions very cautiously as he is not aware of the environment. However, when immediate danger becomes evident, suddenly all of his actions are moving much faster and there's a lot less wind up and a lot less hesitation in those motions. Arc refers to the path that your motion takes in Blender. You can actually turn this on with the motion path visualizer. You can grab key components such as your character's hips or root bone and view the motion paths to ensure that you're getting good arcs on your motions. What's a good arc look like? And generally, organic objects will have very circular patterns and mechanical objects will have straighter patterns. So you can see here in a lot of the Agent 327 motions that there are a lot of big sweeping motions so that our characters come with a lot of kind of circular arcs that read really well on the screen and add a lot of interest and angle and depth to the motion that they are conveying. However, it is worth noting that the further an object speeds increases, the less likely you are to have that large arc and you're gonna see a lot more straight lines. For example, now secondary action is something I use a lot on my characters. You may notice that a lot of my characters are simple with very simple ligaments. For example, my watermelon girl character here has very tiny arms and legs and that's honestly so that as an independent animator, I can move her around and animate her much easier without having to deal with a ton of bones. However, I wanted the character to still remaining appealing and that's where secondary action comes in. Secondary action can give a scene more life or context or interest. It can be things like your arms swinging back and forth, the backpack bouncing on a character, or in the case of my short film, her hair bouncing around. And actually I try and use this hair as an emotion too, that if she falls forward sad, her hair will slump for sad as well. Secondary motion just adds a lot of life to your scene, but you need to be careful as to not distract from the main subject matter. For example, when watching Sprite Fight, a lot of these characters have buttons, backpacks, and other elements on them, and these add a lot of interest to the character. However, if these were larger motions than the main motion of the character, such as their face, we'd end up being distracted and losing focus on what matters. Now, timing is closely tied to things like squash and stretch and slow in and slow out, and what it refers to is the amount of frames kind of between your keyframes or actions. So let's look at that charge battery example again. When he grabs the battery and then the robot grabs it and they start pulling back and forth, timing plays a role here to convey the amount of resistance and weight behind these actions. In this case, the weight is not the battery itself, but actually the resistance of one another pulling. So by kind of slowly moving into it and then fastly yanking one way, we can see that each character is putting a lot of power in there. Exaggeration. This is what gives your animation character. You exaggerate the animation. This is what separates animation from reality. Even when you watch a more realistically made film like Charge, they're still exaggerating certain actions beyond real life in order to convey certain emotions. This can mean a lot of things. It can be an extreme stretch of a character. Just keep in mind that any action you do can be exaggerated to further convey the emotion that you're trying to communicate in your scene. Now, solid drawing and its base concept is applied to 2D artists only. However, I have a way that it's relevant in 3D. Let's start with the 2D aspect first. What it means is that as you're turning your character around and drawing them from different perspectives, they need to have a consistent volume and structure and size. So you just need to make sure that as you are drawing your characters, you have a deep understanding of kind of the three-dimensional space that they are moving around in. However, how does this apply to us as 3D artists where our objects already exist in the three-dimensional space? Well, similar in nature, I would say that scaling is a massive issue I see with beginners in Blender. So Blender actually has real-world units that you can use to measure all of your objects. And oftentimes I will see people put their characters in a scene and then start putting props in there and nothing is matching to scale. So ensure that everything in your scene is matched to either a real world scale or whatever fictional scale that you have. The scale of your objects and size of your objects will affect how Blender's lighting, depth of field, and camera lens works with them. So ensuring that you have consistent scaling throughout your scenes 
will ensure that you have a realistic perspective for your users. Now, appeal is the most abstract and kind of subjective of these principles. It means that you want to add appeal to your characters, give them charisma, so to speak. Of course, when it comes to stylistic things like anime versus realism, you know, part of that's going to be up to your audience and what they just personally find appealing. However, there are some universal principles you should consider. For example, when trying to make characters smaller, likable, or more innocent, you may want to go for more symmetrical features on your face or kind of baby-like features. If you're going with a character that is supposed to be large and brooding, you know, you may want to do large square shapes and give them a tall frame. So just consider when you're doing your character design, what the shapes that make up your, your character are conveying to the audience. Is this an innocent, small, sweet character? A large foreboding character? Is this an athletic or fast character? So just consider all the shapes and what they're communicating as you design.